think we're already starting, which is great. Nice to see some faces that I haven't yet seen. Perhaps some of you have got your video on for the first time. You don't have to have your video on if you prefer to turn it off. It's just when we um, invite you in that we ask you to, to have it on just so we can make sure you're all registered. We'll get to know you pretty soon. So I hope everybody's had a relaxed afternoon and have taken care of yourself in whatever way you felt was appropriate and helpful. And uh, hopefully by now some energy has started to come up a little bit. And uh, this evening I wanted to talk a bit about trust, which is another way that we can uplift and inspire ourselves in the practice. And trust is actually essential to our commitment to the path. You know, it's one of the first, it is the first of the balas, the spiritual strengths. And um, it immediately gives rise to energy. So the second spiritual strength is energy, virya. Somebody mentioned that earlier today. And they were quite right that it is one of the factors of enlightenment as well as one of the strengths. But the reason that this trust can um, lead into energy, one of the reasons is that when we have a little bit of trust in the practice, in goodness, in kindness, in letting go, then the practice becomes a little bit less ego driven. And as a result, we can free up some energy for the mind. Ajahn Brown calls it being on cruise control. <laughs> so, you know, the sort of confidence rouses that inspiration and then you can let the energies flow. And I looked up the word for trust in the uh, English dictionary and it's quite a nice definition. It says a reliance or a resting of the mind on someone or something which is good, honorable, or which has integrity, or maybe friendship or love. So it's a, a reliance on those beautiful qualities, maybe in another person or maybe within ourselves. And through that reliance, we can actually come to rest our mind. So this trust, this confidence can give the mind some comfort and some um, security, a resting place for the mind. Not only that, of course, it does give rise sorry, to this beautiful energy that um, maintains the motivation and in turn leads into patience. Yeah, so trust can be the proximate cause for patience because when we have confidence that, you know, our efforts do will bear fruit and that every seed we plant, every seed of kindness, every step we take on the path will eventually lead towards increasing peace, wisdom and freedom then we can have more patience with the process. So we essentially start putting our trust much more into what we're doing with what we have right now. And the practice as a result becomes less result oriented. We're much less interested in the outcomes than we are in the way we're walking on that path. And there's a lovely simile in the suttas that says, it's like you've got these big jars of water and imagine that the jar is so high, you can't see the top of that jar. But what you can know is that you can put in drops of water, drop by drop by drop. And as long as there's no leak in that jar, you can be sure that drop by drop, the jar fills up. What we don't know is when those jars are going to overflow, You know, when our hearts are going to start overflowing with the beautiful qualities that we cultivate here together. But it doesn't really matter. It could be you know, the next week, or it could be in 20 lifetimes, if you believe in future lives. So the trust in the process starts to take away our concern with outcomes and helps us to really rest the mind and enjoy the process as it unfolds. So in Buddhism, it's important to say that trust isn't something that we either have or we don't have, but it's something like anything else on the path that is to be developed, yeah? And of course, we don't talk about blind trust in, in Buddhism. Trust always has to go hand in hand with discernment. So only in the beginning, we can start off with what we can call provisional trust before we start the practice. You may hear the teachings, perhaps they resonate for you, perhaps they really make sense. You hear about suffering and the causes and that the causes um, can be eradicated. And for me, that gave rise to an enormous amount of confidence 
although I did hear about it in the meditation retreat, but just hearing that there's a possibility to end suffering roused so much in inspiration and energy, it really kept me going for years. You know, I was just so delighted to have finally found something that had some meaning, some real meaning to solve the existential problems of life. And so that provisional step is very important that we have enough trust to understand that there may be things that we can't yet verify through experience. We may have to take a little bit of a leap of faith just in the beginning to try it out as though you're going swimming and you want to try out the water, you stick your toe in there first of all. And then when you find that, oh, the water temperature is not too bad, you know, it actually feels quite nice on my feet. Then you can walk in a little bit more deeply and see how that feels. So after some time, when we start to gain some benefit from the teachings, the confidence, the trust, the faith becomes inspired. I really love the translation of uh, Sada as a kind of inspired confidence, because you actually um, are able to verify it in part, and yet also have the inspiration that if what I've already put into practice has this many results, then surely maybe the next step is also going to have even deeper and more beneficial results. So we can start becoming more and more courageous in a sense um, and take gradually deeper steps. And then over time, of course, this confidence does become verified when we start to gain the results of meditation until it's unshakable at the time of stream entry, when you actually experience the Dhamma and can actually experience what the Buddha means by um, everything having a cause and that cause being subject to cessation. So at that time, the, the confidence is completely unshakable and that's what, one of the qualities of a stream entry, that they have this unshakable trust in the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, not only as external refuges, but as internal refuges that are within one's own mind. They become actual places that you can go to, that you can visit again and again in your own heart. Places of freedom, places of liberation, places of peace and love. Yeah, And this is when the refuges really become very, very powerful. We start to take the qualities of the Buddha as our guide, the qualities of the Dhamma. Yeah, the Dhamma is apparent here and now. We can experience whatever we experience to some Dhamma, right? And somebody asked the question today about the hindrances, and I did want to um, mention that again, because one of the ways you can know which hindrances are arising in the mind is by trying out the antidotes, yeah? So yesterday we talked about loving kindness. And loving kindness is the classic antidote to any kind of ill will, aversion, irritation, even mild sadness or uh, frustration. So if you try to practice loving kindness and you find that your mind becomes more peaceful, more happy, and the anger starts to fade away, then you can be sure that you were experiencing some negativity, some anger or ill will. And in a similar way with the trust, the trust is the antidote to doubt. So if you're not quite sure what hindrance it is, you can try metta or you can try working with trust. And if you find that suddenly you gain more clarity and you, you know the confusion starts to fade and your mind becomes much more inwardly confident and assured, then you might be able to infer that that indeed was doubt, yeah? And so this is what I mean by the Dhamma being apparent here and now. You know, we can actually understand more about Dhamma by looking at our mind and the way it works and looking at the kind of qualities that we need to develop to lead ourselves towards states of deeper peace. So in the suttas, um, in the gradual training, confidence, trust is one of the very first factors, one of the um, starting points for the training on the path. And of course, that comes after hearing the teachings. First, we have to hear the teachings of the Buddha to develop confidence in them. And from that confidence, um, we become inspired to train, to practice virtue, to train in harmlessness, you know, to purify our minds. And it's really beautiful when we start living a, a harmless life. You start to notice that people have a natural sense of trust around you. They feel safe in your presence. 
And I'm very fortunate, um, like many of you, to be uh, associated with many wise people. Of course, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, is the one who comes to mind. And when I'm around him, I just feel so at ease and so incredibly safe that there's really nothing to hide. You know, I think in the beginning, when we meet sort of famous teachers, especially people who we might be somewhat in awe of, we can feel a little bit intimidated or, you know, even over reverential in a, in a sense. But Ajahn Brown very quickly tried to sort of shake me out of that. When I first met him, I was pretty much trembling with respect. I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I finally meeting my teacher. Because I knew he was my teacher before we even met. Um, and very quickly he started to treat me like a friend and joke around with me, even kind of tease me and, and in a way treat me like a sister. And, um, and I think that was very skillful because what it meant was that I could be myself, he could see me, he could see my weaknesses, my strengths. And also it gave me the confidence to be able to ask him questions on absolutely anything that there was still doubt around. And this is so important with the teachers, you know, and the teachings that we can analyze, we can discuss, we can pick them apart and even disagree. Yeah. So anybody who says you have to respect me and that should mean that you just agree with me and trust what I say, you have to be very careful. I'm sure everyone here knows that. Um, and yet it's surprising how many people do get sucked in you know, by false claims of enlightenment or lamas who are supposed to be the next reincarnation of a, a previous lama and then they get involved in, you know, sexual misconduct. So we really have to have this faculty, this critical faculty that is open and it, but is also investigative. And if you do meet a teacher who you feel this person may have something, you know, maybe they've experienced something, something um, that I've yet to experience, then be open to that possibility and yet keep on checking them out. You know, do their actions and speech, do their actions and um, yeah, what they teach match up or are there, are there huge differences there? Don't expect anyone to be perfect because we're all just human beings at the end of the day, you know, there's no such thing as sort of somebody who's aware of every little movement and always equanimous, whatever that means, you know, but just to see that there's a congruence there. And then you can really um, bit by bit develop that trust. And I've reached the stage now with Ajahn Brown that there is a very unshakable level of trust. And, um, you know, I really can go to him with anything. Um, without feeling fear of being shamed. I don't think I've ever been made to feel ashamed of anything that I've confided or, you know, told to him. And this is an incredible feeling of safety to have in another being's presence. And sometimes having that confidence in a teacher is beautiful when we lack the confidence in ourselves. And so sometimes you can borrow confidence from people who are able to see your potential where you haven't yet know, seen that yet. So there was one time, for example, in uh, Kairos, when we were doing a little retreat a couple of years ago, and um, I was saying, oh, it's a long path and I've been practicing a while and I don't know if I'm really gonna break through in this lifetime, especially because I have so much work to do and you know, my life is quite unsettled. And he just looked at me and said, do you have confidence in me? And I said, well, obviously. <laughs> And he said, then you should have confidence in the confidence I have in you. <laughs> very tricky. He always likes to, uh, <laughs> he's very clever. So you can play these uh, tricky games, but it's absolutely true, isn't it? That if I have confidence in him, I should have confidence that he perhaps can see something that I've yet to see in myself. And, you know, this goes for all of us. This is why spiritual friendship is so important because sometimes we don't yet see our true potential. But eventually, you know, as we start to work with the hindrances and overcome the obstacles to meditation, we start to see we do have this capacity for peace and we start to be able to trust in that peace and trust in the path leading to that peace, yeah? 
So I don't want to speak too much longer because this is really a, a session for some meditation practice and some Q&A. Um, but we'll do a little guided meditation using the theme of trust to try and bring some of that um, slight emotional element into the practice because sometimes it can get a little bit dry and trust is somehow akin to love. You know, the two are so related. How can we really love without trust? So when we have this trust, it can open the heart and help us to be just a little bit more um, curious and inquisitive and also let go a little bit more deeply into the present moment. So let's uh, get comfortable. And we can have a guided meditation for about 25 minutes or so before we do some questions. If you need to stretch first, that's fine. So with your eyes closed, checking into your body. And just scanning through the body with calm clarity. Seeing if there's anything that needs to be adjusted or moved. I often find my ankles are pressing in a little bit too tightly to my thighs or to each other. Or maybe there's some clothing that's a little tight. So this is not to be fussy, but it's another way of offering a sense of care to your body, establishing the right intention of kindness, gentleness. to facilitate the letting go. And just spending some time with your own body, bathing it in loving awareness, kindfulness. So that wherever your mindfulness goes, the quality of loving kindness follows. making caring your main concern. Not trying to push away any discomfort, but just finding out what kind of attention, what kind of holding or handling those sensations need. And if it helps, you might imagine all the tensions that may have built up in the body, perhaps in the shoulders, the upper back or the knees, 
Imagine them all draining downwards into the ground. As you surrender your weight, your body to the gravity. Trusting the earth, the ground beneath you to hold your weight. So you can let go of any holding. Let everything hang down. And to start the meditation, I'd like to offer a visualization, which you can join in with if you wish. Imagine yourself in a place which represents safety to you. A place where you feel contented and at ease. If you're very fortunate, it might be right where you are. Or there may be some place where you've meditated and has a very spiritual sense. A place that's calm and quiet. Perhaps which is not so much associated with your everyday working life. Where you don't need to be anyone. Perhaps no one even knows your name. Could even be outdoors on a beach. Perhaps with the golden sunshine falling down on you. Any place that you feel safe, secure, protected and at ease. Notice that feeling in your own body. Perhaps a slight settling, softening, deeper relaxation. And now, if you wish, imagine that you're sitting there, not alone, but with someone who represents love and kindness or benevolence. It gives you a sense of confidence and trust. I like to imagine myself seated between my teachers, the Buddha in the front, Ajahn Brown behind me, 
He's got my back. And two other very trusted Kalyanamitta spiritual friends to my side. And I imagine them gazing upon me with eyes of trust. without any concern for me at all, seeing my potential, knowing that the conditions for awakening have already been planted in my heart. And as I sit in this force field of loving kindness, of care, of safety, I can hand over a lot of my own effort, struggle or doubt. Trusting that I have all the wisdom, all the teachings within. And the only thing necessary are the conditions. Which now are optimal for the process to unfold. How do you feel in the presence of this benevolent person or persons who you trust? And as you sit here basking in that sense of safety and kindness, you start to notice the silence in the mind. Silence is another refuge, a resting place for your poor overthinking mind.
And the more you trust in this silence, the more the silence seems to grow. Until the thoughts are just like little wispy clouds floating through the sky, but not really touching or hanging around in that sky. As though those clouds were falling off the edges of your mind. as the beautiful, still refuge of silence starts to grow. Starts to draw the mind within. The spaces between your thoughts, between my words, get longer. As you start to trust the stillness, the silence as a refuge for your mind. And with that trust comes friendship. You befriend the silence. And the silence starts to glow with gratitude at last. I'm being valued. A very subtle pleasure and delight in the silence and stillness of the mind. We start to tune into that. Holding it gently, not forcing it to stay.
if you wish, you can continue to simply delight in the silent spaces in the mind. Or ask the mind, would you like to see the breath? And if that breath comes in, treat it like a very special, sacred friend. Cocooning the breath with silence and with love. Allowing the breath to hold the mind. The breath becomes another resting place, another refuge for your mind to lay down and relax entrusting your mind to the breath and simply allowing the journey to unfold. Seeing how much you can let go. Trusting the conditions 
supported by the loving kindness, benevolence and warmth of your spiritual guides. They know where this path is leading. They know you're walking just as you should. Drop by drop, the jars get full. And with trust, you have all the time in the world. If you wish to continue meditating, please do so. Otherwise, to come out of the meditation. Again, imagine yourself sitting in this very safe, cozy place. Perhaps with the Buddha or another spiritual friend or friends. And imagine the smile of these beings radiating loving kindness towards you. A smile of confidence fully assured of where this path will lead. Imbuing that same sense of confidence in you. As they are now you too shall be as they are now you too shall be without a bell you may open your eyes or not but either way see if you can keep part of your attention within particularly noticing any peace any stillness feeling of safety or ease and protecting, guarding that quality as though it were a very precious friend. Do 
staying connected as we meet and move into some more question and answers. Except you're all enlightened now, so we don't need any question and answers. <laughs> Very good. So I hope that was helpful. And if not, that's also really fine. Because what I'm trying to do with these evenings is just offer some slightly different um, perceptions or ways of looking that can be used as tools whenever you, you just feel you might need to pick something different up. I think I'm quite uh, strong in the Sada qualities because I've been very fortunate to have wonderful teachers. So it's quite easy for me to connect to the very beautiful, noble qualities that, uh, that the Sangha do embody and get so much inspiration from that. <laughs> and I think the more you practice this path and start to understand that, you know, doctrines of non-self, um, that there really is nobody in here, we are a conditioned process, the more confidence that can bring because as long as the conditions that we surround ourselves by are helpful and positive and uh, leading to a deeper understanding of the Dhamma, then naturally our mind has to start inclining in that direction. We're simply a product of causes. Good. So I think there is one question that's uh, come in, but it's to me. And I did want to remind everybody to please send your questions to Anne-Marie. Don't worry about that first one. I'll answer that. But um, it just stops any repetition happening because uh, sometimes it looks like there are three questions, but really there's two of them are from the same person. So if you can please send all the questions to Anne-Marie and she'll send them straight over to me. Uh, yes. So yes, uh, Anne-Marie's kindly reminded me that there is an opportunity to ask live if you wish to. So if you want to ask the question yourself, still please write it in the box and still keep it concise. But if you put the word me, M-E in big letters, before your question, we can unmute you and you can ask the question verbally yourself but you will be on the video recording. So please uh, know that. I have to say that to cover us as far as safeguarding goes. So uh, that's what will happen. And again, just to, uh, to give you that opportunity, but um, to keep it as concise as possible in case we do have a lot of questions. So, so far there aren't many questions at all, which is uh, kind of surprising, but also probably quite a good thing, quite a good sign. There's no more doubt. <laughs> okay so the first question and please excuse me I'm a little bit tired tonight so I'll try to be as clear as I can but uh, if anything's not clear put in the question the second time right are the hindrances related to not allowing yourself to be and to controlling yourself and others so that's an interesting question. Definitely the hindrances are to do with control. They are coming from a sense of self um, because to have a sense of self, there has to be something for a sense of self to do. So when we believe we exist, we have to exert that, uh, that existence. We have to show that we really are here. And sometimes the hindrances, of course, are very um, coarse and manifest themselves quite obviously, you know, in terms of um, actually pushing other people around or talking to yourself in very controlling and tyrannical ways. But even in the deeper stages of meditation, it's really interesting to see what happens. For example, when the mind starts to get really empowered and really still. Um, I've had experiences where the, the bliss starts to get very, very strong. And although I can feel where it's taking me and I can feel that if I let go into that, it will be a very automatic process. 
there's a very subtle hindrance that just wants to check out what's happening. I call it like sticky fingers because I'm not really um, doing anything, but it's like what I call the assessor sort of comes in and it's like, oh, what's this? Oh, oh. It's just a very subtle leaning forward, leading, leaning into the future and sort of anticipating what's coming next. And I've noticed in myself that I'm sometimes doing that just to show that I'm still in control. It's very subtle, but it's really fascinating at that point because you think that you want to let go. You think that the sense of self is ready to be revealed, you know, or the lack of a sense of self is ready to be exposed. And yet there's something holding you back. And that is certainly related to control. You know, control is related to a sense of self. So yes, I would say that most of the hindrances are, especially the desire, the aversion, um, the doubt can be, which is also why the trust can be helpful. I mean, I find it really helpful to reflect on beings who I know are wiser than me, because I think that's one of the um, advantages sometimes that Christians or people from um, theistic religions have, is that they have this idea that they can give up to something higher or to a being higher. So it's not just letting go into a void, is actually letting go into something, into maybe a very powerful source of love or source of truth. And as Buddhists, we don't really have that. So for me, it's really helpful, rather than having an abstract idea of love or trust or truth, to have an embodied sense of that. So if there is somebody in my life who I feel embodies unconditional love, it's easier for me to connect to that quality through remembering how I feel around them or how that manifests itself in, in our relationship. So that can be quite helpful. And, and um, that practice that we just did was an example of the way I sometimes practice in retreat, especially when there's hindrances are very strong. I almost mentally sort of say to my teachers, right, I give up, you take over, right? okay, I've got the teachings, I know everything I need to know, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't make those causes and conditions come together just when I want them to. So I'm gonna sit between you and you just do it for me. And uh, of course that's just a skillful means, we're not giving over our control to an outside agent at all, but it can help to just um, remind ourselves that we do have whatever's needed, you know? And sometimes we're just trying too hard. We're just doubting ourselves, being too hard on ourselves. It's a very, very common hindrance, which is why I, I like to emphasize loving kindness so much. I think the main hindrance for most of us is ill will, um, which manifests in all kinds of different ways. I mean, ill will and desire, they're two sides of the same thing. So if you work with the ill will, you're working with both. And the other hindrance is a sort of, um, different variations on aversion and desire. Okay. Uh, while meditating, sensual or sexy sensations happen, often related to the breath. What does this mean? Why and how to handle this? Yeah. That's an interesting question. It might sound strange to some people, but I have experienced similar things. And I think one of the reasons is that when we first start getting joy and pleasure with the breath, the only thing we really know how to relate it to is sensuality, because that's where we've got pleasure from in the past. We haven't usually had sensuality with the breath, as Ajahn Brahm was saying. It's just air, right? It's just uh, this very neutral sensation. So it's not really that the breath is um, becoming sensual, it's more that the mind is starting to develop some energy and that energy manifests as more happiness, more joy. And it's uh, related to the breath because the breath is where the focus of the mind is at that time. So one thing that I find quite helpful at that time is to try to slightly disembody the breath. Because if the body is still um being perceived uh, along with the breath then that kind of um, sensuality is still in the mix so it's almost like it is a wholesome pleasure it's not actually sensuality it's um a wholesome pleasure that's 
um, generated from the mind. But as long as it's in relationship to the body, it can stay a little bit coarse. So one thing I would suggest is perhaps to become aware more of the knowing of the breath rather than the feeling or the sensation of the breath. Just become aware of like the fact of the breath, if you like. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense because I can't check in with people, but it's more, it's a very subtle shift, but it's just that you're starting to move towards the way the mind knows the breath rather than the way the body feels the breath. So it's more that there is a breath rather than all the details of how that feels. So then the, the sort of sensual or sexy sensations become a little bit more um, um, refined. But don't worry about it at all. I mean, you know, Ajahn Brahm might just say do nothing. And that's also perfectly fine. But he has said this to me before, which is why I share that, because I was still sort of slightly relating it to the physical, um, a very subtle version of the physical body, but all the same, it was still an embodied experience. So um, it's quite common, I would say, and it's not uh, anything you need to worry about. The mind will gradually just go to wherever that joy, wherever that bliss is more refined and more peaceful. So see if you can get a taste for peace and um, sometimes noticing that that sensation is slightly agitating can be enough to sort of turn you towards the subtler happiness that is also there within that experience. It's like there's different layers of happiness and some of them are like a slightly different frequency. It's almost like tuning into different radio waves. So some of them are like quite kind of coarse and quite like cool and maybe quite interesting and then some of them are more like and then some are just so it's all of these frequencies can be happening so I mean please don't do too much because Ajahn Brown will definitely tell me off but it's almost like you just gently incline the mind to something slightly subtler you can even ask the question what is peace I really like that to ask the mind, what is peace? And then the mind just tends to follow that suggestion. So be very gentle in those stages. Okay, so I have a question. Whether it's correct to say that trust is perhaps the only way to approach letting go of will and the quitting of desire I wouldn't necessarily say it's the only way, but I would say that it's a very important to have that sense of trust and confidence. As I said, it is the first of the five indriyas or the five balas, the strengths, the powers of the mind, which then gives rise to energy and to um, samadhi and to wisdom and equanimity. So confidence is important, um, but there are other ways to let go as well. Um, I mean, in a way, all these terms are just talking about different aspects of the same thing, but the literal ways of letting go that the Buddha talks about in the third noble truth are things more similar to contentment. Contentment and trust is very close, but contentment is a little bit more like, I would say sort of it has a warm emotional quality. I think trust also has a kind of warm emotional quality, but contentment is just a slightly different angle on that. It's a real sort of um, settling inward and looking inward and staying with exactly what we have right now. So this is also a really good way of stopping that restless mind and that desiring mind from moving on and outward. The contentment tends to move the mind within. So contentment means staying with what you have and going more deeply into the moment rather than on to something else. So contentment is also a theme that you could explore in there. So I'm, I didn't answer that in a huge amount of depth because I want to make sure I cover everyone's question, but I would say just, you know, try it out if, if the confidence and also the person asking the question, since I know you a little bit, I think confidence could be a really good one to work with for some time, especially this sense that you're around people that you trust, 
you know, and bringing them to mind and just developing that confidence that you are in safe hands, so to speak, yeah? Even if the people aren't there, you're actually in the hands of the Dhamma. Everything that you're being taught here is either from the suttas or it's from the personal experience of people who have a great understanding or a deep understanding of those suttas. I mean, I won't say that my own understanding is incredibly deep. I, I can't say that, but, you know, it's something that goes hand in hand with my practice. And I measure my practice according to the Buddha's insights to make sure I'm not going off track, you know. So, so you have all that guidance and you have the opportunity to ask questions. So you are very safe. Okay. So someone's asking if during the personal practice time, um, she finds it useful to read about meditation in addition to practicing it. Is this fine or is it not recommended for this retreat? So I would say on the most part that it's probably encouraged to um, simplify the mind as much as you can and to let go of any external activities, even like reading and writing, as far as that is helpful to you. But if you find that, you know, you have a book about meditation that's really helping to kind of consolidate some of these teachings and that's helping you to gain clarity and perhaps inspire your mind, then, you know, try it out, but do it in moderation. Because sometimes on retreat, um, part of it is that we're getting inspiration which is great, but then a part of the mind also can become a little bit restless and hungry and want to have more. So just check when it's spilling over into restlessness and, and perhaps distracting yourself from being with an experience that's arising for you in the moment. Yeah. So on the whole, we want to start experiencing the Dhamma in a more embodied way. Um, so just experiment for yourself. I wouldn't say, you know, it's forbidden, um, but just see if you can take a little bit and because the mind will probably be quite clear and quite receptive. So just a little bit might be enough. And then and that can give you a little bit of guidance or direction for the next part of the day. Yeah. So try that um, and experiment for yourself. There's no real right or wrong. And if you find you've gone a bit too far into the reading and then you were tired because of that, then the next day you cut it back a bit, right? Or if one day you went completely cold turkey and you felt sort of lost, then, you know, just, just adapt it. So please be uh, very natural and uh, trust yourself with that. So someone's asking, is it okay to include a bit of yoga in the afternoons or even a play in the sea? Oh, you're asking a nun who would love to play in the sea, but my rules don't allow and I don't have any sea nearby. <laughs> so I can't say no. <laughs> uh, I find it helps my body relax, but I don't want to overstimulate. Exactly. So you already know what you're looking for. You're looking for the relaxation, but not the agitation. So just see if you can find a middle way there. Um, I think generally if it's exercise, that stimulation can be good. It's a physical energy. So unless it's kind of disturbing your mind because you're seeing lots of people and there's dogs and people with, I don't know, push chairs and people saying hello to you, then yes, that could be overstimulating. If it's freezing cold and you get like a brain freeze, that could also be overstimulating. <laughs> so if you're going to get in the sea, I would say take a hot flask. You probably know about this better than me, but take a hot flask and some blankets and and just, uh, yeah, don't make it a rule, you know, don't sort of decide, OK, I'm going to do yoga in the afternoons and play in the sea, especially at this time or at that time, because there might be some days you really want to do that. And the next day you don't actually. But then you feel that because you said you would, you should. And you get into this kind of, yeah, kind of trying to preempt what's going to feel right for you at any given time. So just play it by ear. And um, I would definitely recommend doing some exercise for sure. Yoga's a good one. Um, maybe some brisk walking, maybe even some jogging. Um, during my three-month retreat, 
I was pretty much in solitude and I wanted to really make use of the solitude as best I could because I'd actually planned to do three months complete solitude in, in Perth. And Ajahn Brahm had basically agreed that I could stay in my cottage and not really see anybody um, and even have my food bought there which is quite a privilege actually. So I wouldn't spread that one around <laughs> because this has been negotiating for many, many years. Actually, I'm on live stream anyway. So I was gonna have uh, this three months retreat. So I tried to sort of emulate it here because the advantage of being here, of course, was that I was living alone due to the COVID restrictions. I had a uh, very little choice about that. Um, so I did incorporate exercise almost every day, but I'd go out at the quietest time. So I'd go out sort of straight after my breakfast, which was still quite early. And um, in Oxford, you have to go when the paths have opened. So some of the paths are not actually open until sort of 7.30. So I'd go at that time and I'd only see the same people daily. So they got to know that I was quiet and never really said anything. And anyway, people in Oxford don't speak to each other very much. They're not like the Northerners where I'm from. <laughs> so, um, so it was actually really quiet. So yeah, if you're gonna play in the sea, then maybe do it at a quiet time when not too many people are around and uh, look after yourself. Sounds great to me. <laughs> When you talk of perceptions of metta, do you mean Vedana, sensory experience, emotions or thoughts or something else? Yeah, that's a really good question. Perceptions of metta. It can be all of that, but it starts for me with a kind of inclining of the mind. And the best way I can describe the way that I do it is like, it's as though mindfulness is this sort of medium. It's almost like a light that shines on my experience. So it can be a Vedana, a sensory experience, or it can be a thought, it can be anything in my field of experience. The mindfulness is like, yeah, the medium, the light. And then through that medium, I add kindness. So it's like the light is the brightness and the kindness is the warmth in that light. So the two together. It's almost as though there's a torch and the mindfulness is going through the body, like lighting up various places. And as they're lit up, as they become you know, clear to my perception, I can then add kindness to that. So it's very subtle and it's hard to put into words. But for me, the metta is a kind of friendliness, a sort of warmth, a sort of um, caringness. <laughs> maybe a softness, it can be instead of like penetrating straight into a sensation, I go in more softly, I go in with a sense of, oh, I'm meeting a friend. So yeah, it's, a, it's probably more a mental perception, but it of course meets experience at the sensory, emotional and thought level. So I hope that kind of makes sense. In one of the suttas, is it, um, Oh, it's in the Diganikaya. Probably some of you here might know. Oh, I think it's the Potapada Sutta. And the Buddha says basically that the whole of meditation is like a training of perceptions. It's a skillful way of inclining the mind. Ways of looking that undermine the hindrances. Ways of looking that lead to wholesome states increasing and unwholesome states decreasing. So it's not necessarily very active. Someone was asking that question to Ajahn Brahm about whether it's too active to sort of intentionally replace one thought with another or intentionally cultivate states of loving kindness. But for me, they're not so active because they sort of come imbued in the way that I'm experiencing um, my inner world. So the metta is more like like I said yesterday, like a lens in a way that I'm looking through. So you could imagine that the mindfulness is like just a plain lens and the meta kind of adds a little bit of pink. <laughs> or you could imagine that the lens of mindfulness is actually not very clean because we have our defilements and the meta is like GIF that cleans the lens. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. I mean, these are just sort of ways that I sort of try to describe it to myself but um yeah just give it some experiment really and and see 
if you can bring a little more warmth into the practice and if you can and you find that the hindrances of ill will or irritation agitation are re reducing then you know that that must have been meta there must have been some more love and kindness in the way that you're aware okay Okay, we have a newcomer to the group. Welcome, Bogdan. I know that you joined on a, one of the last minute people that we invited in, so it's nice to have you here. Okay, so that's an interesting question. You're asking, how do you become confident without becoming proud? So I think this is around what we become confident of, what we are placing our confidence in. And I would say that we're actually taking our confidence away from a sense of self, away from our own person, our own perceived qualities or weaknesses, and putting our confidence in something much more universal, putting our confidence in the qualities of goodness, in the qualities of kindness. As a monastic, I have to have a lot of trust in kindness. One of our reflections is that um, my very life is sustained by the gift of others. This should be reflected upon again and again by one who has gone forth. And it's so amazing to reflect on that because we don't reflect on that to feel guilty or to feel bad about it. That, oh dear, everyone's looking after me. I better be a good nun or a good monk. It's more that people's kindness is actually enabling me to live. You know, I'm actually subsisting only because people are not only kind enough to give to me because I'm a nun. It's not really about me. It's because people are so kind that they actually want to put resources into areas that can help spread the Dhamma. And this, to me, is incredibly inspiring when I reflect in that way, to think that there are so many people that value the teachings of kindness, of Dhamma, of harmlessness, of virtue, of deep, deep peace, of wisdom. They value that so much that they'd rather put their really hard earned resources in that direction than perhaps go to the shops and get themselves something new. They're willing to make sacrifices because they see where our true benefit lies. And that's just an incredibly inspiring um, reflection for me that helps me to have faith in kindness. So it's not that then I would have faith in myself for being a kind person. It's more that I would then recognize that, oh, if the quality of kindness is within me, this is something that I want to cultivate because that kindness is going to be beneficial not only to me, but to so many other people. It's not going to stop with me. If that's real kindness, it's something that's caused, first of all. It's something that is not, I can't own that, you know, it arises from certain causes but I can feel more confident about what those causes are and I can see to it that I put those causes in place because I know that it's gonna bring me happiness and if I'm happy, that happiness is going to be generated to other people. You know, and that's in turn gonna inspire others to develop kindness within themselves. So we reflect in ways that you know, focus on the qualities, focus on putting the causes in place for those qualities that arise, to arise. And again, you know, this is why it can be very helpful to reflect on things like the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha as external refuges also, you know, as the Buddha is a, is, was a human being who started like us. He started with struggles. He struggled with his sexuality. He struggled with, you know, with lust, with temptation, with um, self-mortification. He followed the two extremes, right? He was a human being that struggled with doubts, with not knowing the correct path, with sleepiness. And yet he then broke through to the noble truths and he realized something that no one else around him at that time in India had experienced and had perceived. He actually broke through and became a fully awakened being, completely free from the causes of suffering, from the causes of ill will, delusion and desire, right? Well, delusion is the cause for ill will. And, desire so he broke through delusion and he um yeah broke through to wisdom to the opposite of delusion to vidya so we can have confidence in him we can understand that although i have the potential to awaken there is something i've yet to realize there's something i've yet to attain there are beings who've walked further further on this path than i have 
and toward whom I can ins- uh, aspire to be like. I can aspire to develop the qualities of a Buddha in my own heart. So I find that really helpful. And as I said, I'm someone who takes a lot of inspiration from others. So that really helps me because it helps me to get a sense that I must have some of that inside in order to recognize it in another. But it also um, shows me that that seed still has to be nurtured. And, um, And really, that's my job to nurture those seeds. And of course, if you have a teacher like in Ajahn Brown, you see that, wow, not only does a person who's realized the Dhamma at a very profound stage, um, not only are they very happy and at peace, but they spend their whole lives serving others and spreading the Dhamma. You know, no matter how tired they are, no matter how many other um, responsibilities they have, it's just absolutely incredible that he keeps on taking on more you know, and he said to us recently at the volunteer meeting, he said, some people say that I should stop, you know, I shouldn't serve so much, I'm wearing myself out. But I have to do it, I want to do it, you can't stop me. (laughs) You know, and I honestly think he'll be talking until, well, I mean, he's meditating as well, but he'll continue teaching as long as he's alive, I'm pretty sure. As long as he can, as long as his faculties are intact, the jokes might get worse. (laughs) <laughs> he might you know he might start repeating himself but from where it's coming from will be the same it will be coming from that place of complete purity and just pure love for the dhamma so i've been around Ajahn Brahm a long time now and in a in a close student disciple way and um i can say that he's running on the brahma viharas you know he's coming from a place of loving kindness compassion mudita sympathetic joy a lot of joy and also the equanimity you know so he's just teaching for the sake of teaching without being invested in results and i think that's part of this question too that we learn to put our confidence in the causes we invest in the causes we put all our energy into the process yeah into what we're doing now and we divest ourselves from outcomes and results it's not about outcomes and results it's not about spiritual brownie points or whether this was a jhana or not a jhana or what stage am i at it's all about what you're doing now with what you have and can you add that little bit more kindness because if you can then you're surely walking on the path so that's what you can put your trust in so i hope that helps Trusting in cause and effect. Okay, how would you feel, how would you handle a situation when you feel that trust is being questioned and it is important to address this? Trust is being questioned. So I'm not quite sure whether this person means that um, that somebody's done something that would render them not worthy of trust possibly and that they're losing their confidence in someone or that somebody is not being trusted when they feel they need to be trusted. So I guess I'll try and say a few words on both, but I think that um, if you feel that, you know, you're not being trusted when you're actually worthy of trust, um, then I think patience is important because we can't demand trust from anyone. Trust is something that needs to be, um, I wouldn't say earned, but in a way, I'm not sure I can find a better word. Um, It's a very precious gift. You know, for somebody to give you their full trust is an incredibly precious gift. And a person is making themselves potentially very vulnerable by doing that. So as I said, even with the people that I trust implicitly at this stage, even though I've trusted them from the start, enough to leave my teacher in Burma and fly over to Germany in the hope of meeting Ajahn Brown, that was how much trust I had. I had no idea where my monastic life would go to from there. I had nowhere to stay, but I left because I had that trust. But still, I've been checking him out ever since. (laughs) (laughs) probably not still I'm not sure but it is a kind of ongoing thing because I want to know where he's coming from on all kinds of different issues 
and I want to watch how he handles situations and how he responds to people. And sometimes my perceptions are wrong. Sometimes I might think, oh, he's being a bit dismissive or, oh, didn't that sound a bit sexist? And I'll ask, I'll ask him about it because I need to feel that trust. So if there's a doubt in my mind, I go to him and I ask and um, he doesn't have to tell me, you know. So I don't think we can demand trust from anyone. I think it's something that we really have to um, to be patient with and to do quite a lot of work ourselves to be worthy of that trust. Um, because none of us have completely pure intentions unless we're enlightened, right? And sometimes we may think we do, but they may be slightly misguided. We may feel that we're, um, you know, that our intentions are very pure, but someone else might sense that they're not and someone else might be right. So sometimes this is helpful, right? That we kind of check each other out and we feed back to each other because we may see things in another that we're not able to see or that they're not able to see or, but please only give feedback when invited, you know, we, we shouldn't be going around uh, demanding feedback or, or um, giving out feedback if a person's not ready to receive it. So then the other one, how would you handle a situation when you feel trust is being questioned? Hmm. I have a feeling I answered what you meant, but if we feel that we've trusted someone and now we're not sure we can trust them, especially if it's someone in a, um, a role of leadership or um, especially spiritual leadership and you feel there's actually misconduct going on, then please, please investigate. I mean, I don't really know all the procedures there, but I know that there are some groups who sort of try to cover that up and this is really dangerous. Um, if a person has nothing to hide, they won't mind being questioned. Um, you have a responsibility actually to be open to scrutiny. So definitely don't let anybody's status or power put you off as long as you're safe, as long as you're safe to do that. Okay. Okay. So discovering early Buddhism was a turning point that caused many changes in my life and behavior. Unfortunately, those changes are unacceptable by some members of my family. It seems that they'd like me to stay with them and behave like them. I think that they're afraid that they'll lose me. I always try to address them with much metta and karuna, but usually the calmer I am, the angrier they become. Yeah, sometimes I feel as if I had to choose between going with what I think I should do and what they want me to do. How would you suggest to act? Yeah, it's really difficult if you're with people who are not necessarily spiritual companions for you and you want to practice seriously and start aligning your life more deeply to the Dhamma, it can be quite difficult. I mean, straight away I'd say, um, you know, not to try and convince them that what you're doing is right, but to go about what you're doing with a lot of um, discretion in a sense and humility and, and as you are doing, you know, behave towards them with kindness and compassion as best you can, but perhaps not over much because I've also noticed that sometimes when we're sort of too kind or, People can interpret that as being a little bit pious or superior and perhaps they feel it reflects badly on them because they just don't feel that way. So I think real loving kindness is more about accepting people exactly as they are rather than sort of um, being kind to them to perhaps calm them down or make them less hateful. Of course we want that to happen. I mean, I would be lying if I didn't say that, <laughs> you know, if there's someone very angry, of course, you want to be kind to them to soothe them. And part of that motivation may well be that I have an easier life myself, <laughs> um, because it's not helpful for anyone if someone else is very angry. But just check there, because if they are in an angry mood, the most kind thing at that point might be to leave them alone and give them space rather than be kind. So sometimes, unfortunately, it seems that the person in the family who's doing a lot of spiritual practice can become almost like a scapegoat in a way 
for the rest of the family's unprocessed emotions because they feel that you're stronger and they feel that you can handle it. So it's easier for them to sort of project it on you. And of course, in my role, that happens all the time. You know, people sort of see something in me that they take this way or that way and they project whatever irritation they have onto me. Also because they want me to be some kind of perfect person, which I'm not. Um, so this can happen, but yeah, I think for you, it's probably going to be a process whereby you discover whether or not you can continue to live together. Sometimes distance is helpful. I know that for me, I needed to leave my hometown to go to India and to find my path. And it was actually very helpful to be able to speak to my parents about what I was doing from a distance because it wasn't so confronting and I had my space to sort of get into what I was doing and to start to integrate that with my life. And then when I'd come back to them, I mean, sometimes I'd be triggered, of course, and I'd think, oh, now they'll think I'm a terrible meditator because I'm just getting triggered as I was as a teenager, you know. But this is the test, isn't it? And uh, But over time, they've started to see that my commitment, I think this is what they've started to see, that my commitment is very steady and it's been there now for 24 years. I've never talked about anything else other than committing my life to the Dhamma. So... And over time, they start to get interested and see that, aha, uh -huh, yeah, there are things she says or things she does that are different than before, or they even put a different angle on things than what we're hearing from other people. And that becomes attractive. And um, yeah, they've been following some of these sessions. They followed Ajahn Brahm's meditation earlier today. And, um, and yeah, it sort of opened things up for them. There was a softening there. There was a, a receptivity and... Um, and that makes me incredibly happy. And this is after many, many years. So don't give up, but also see if you can take the space that you need. You have to look after yourself. So we're actually at the end of the session and I have quite a few more questions here. So let me see if I can answer any of them quite quickly. Um, I'll answer the last one very quickly because it should be quite easy to answer in brief, but it's a big question. So you could do a whole talk on it. But you ask, oh yeah, it is a bigger question. How are jhanas related to stream entry? Is there any particular jhana related or indicating that stream entry has happened? Okay, so the second question is no. There's no jhana that would let you know that stream entry has happened because the um, deep insights, the liberating insights don't happen in a jhana, they happen outside of it. Um, but the way that they're related to stream entry very, very quickly, in my understanding, is that through the jhanas, what we're trying to do is to overcome the five hindrances. And the five hindrances the Buddha described as the distortions of the mind, or sorry, no, the imperfections of the mind that... Um, is it that distort wisdom? They do distort wisdom. And they're like, um, they make it impossible to see clearly. Yeah. So they're, one of the uh, translations of the word nivarana, which means hindrance, is like curtains of the mind. It's like there's a curtain across your mind that you can't see through. So something's like obscuring your vision. And not only does it obscure clear seeing, it also distorts what you see. So what you think you see is actually um, twisted by the defilements. So you don't see it clearly. It's like as though you see a figure behind like a screen and you think it's a rabbit, but that actually it's a puppet, you know, actually it's two people, it's a hand that's making a rabbit shape or something like that. So we're not able to see things clearly. And when those hindrances are overcome, we can enter the jhana. When we enter into a jhana, the hindrances become overcome for a long period of time. And it's when you emerge afterwards that the mind is very, very clear and that's what's called um, in the commentaries, upachara samadhi. So that's the state of mind where there is again, the possibility to um, investigate, to discern phenomena. So at that time, the mind may naturally start to look in areas like non-self, or it may look in areas of impermanence or of suffering. And at that time, the mind's very, very steady and it's not invested in what it sees. 
So it's not trying to distort the truth. It's not trying to say, no, 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 there must be a self. It's actually incredibly clear and inc incredibly uh, strong and confident. And it has the ability to penetrate deeply into the truth. So at that point, it's possible to see much more deeply into things like non-self and suffering and impermanence. And from there, it's possible that you may break through to stream entry, but it's not certain by any means. You know, some people can be practicing the jhanas deeply for many, many years, for decades before the stream entry experience happens. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think that's enough on that because Although I understand that, I'm not qualified to talk about it in the way that Ajahn Brown is. And it is a question that he may cover um, at some point in the retreat. Okay, so I'll see if I can answer this one just to finish. Okay, so this question is about, um, could I elaborate on what I said about meditation being a training of perceptions uh, for wholesome qualities to arise and unwholesome qualities to be undermined and its reference in the suttas. This sounds very interesting. Okay, so yeah, there's two slightly different things here. Um, the practice of wholesome qualities arising and, and learning to undermine unwholesome qualities is part of the practice of right effort, as Ajahn Brown translates as right endeavor. So that's the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. And um, it's also related to what is called sense restraint, India, sam, Indriya Samvara Sila, it's an aspect of virtue. And sense restraint is about using your mind in ways that leads to the wholesome states increasing and leads to the unwholesome states decreasing. So this is really about not only about how we perceive, but even what we're aware of, what we attend to in our field of perception. So one example of that is um, that we see a person who's very upset or maybe they're angry or shouting or they have coarse behavior. And if we focus on those unpleasant aspects of that person, then we may find that we start getting angry and agitated. So in that sense, the unwholesome qualities are increasing. So what we do with training the perception or training the sense restraint, what we do with sense restraint is to look at that person in a different way. So one way that we could look at that person instead is to consider that they might have had a very difficult day. Yeah, to find some way of empathizing, for example. Another way could be to understand that if a person's angry, they're suffering. And when we realize they're suffering, we might be able to look at them with compassion instead. So this is a wholesome state increasing. Uh, we may be able to look at that person and remember that we've seen them in different states of mind. We've seen them also being a very loving friend or a loving parent. And we may be able to re recollect that aspect of the person and bring that to mind. That's also a way of training our perception or using the senses to look for something that's going to uplift the heart and help us then maybe relate to that person differently in a way that doesn't increase their unhappiness and our own unhappiness. Um, so these are some examples. And I find this really fascinating because it's actually the place where to me, the virtue starts to move into the sitting practice. It becomes a little bit more active. It also becomes um, very relevant to every situation we find ourselves in in daily life. And it also starts to incorporate deeper mindfulness about what's happening in our mind so that we can see the way we're getting pulled and pushed around in the world. And we can see the effect that outside things are having on our internal mind. So this is kind of the bridge in a way between daily life and uh, meditation practice. And you find that if you can organize your, uh, let's say like, say it's like your mind is like a cupboard that's full of complete clutter and complete junk. This is like a mind without sense restraint. So what the sense restraint does is start to put things in shelves 
and try to organize your mind a little bit so that the negative ones don't stay in the cupboard. The mothballs, you can take them out, the dust, you can take it out and you can put in some nice fragrant scents or whatever. You can organize your cupboard a bit better. So when you then go to sit down on your meditation cushion, your mind is not such a big mess. <laughs> yeah, you've already been working on undermining the unwholesome qualities in your daily life. So it's like your daily life becomes the preparation for your sitting meditation. It becomes no, no different in that sense, not separate from your sitting meditation. Okay, so hopefully that helps. And of course, everything feeds into everything else. So if you spend time on your meditation cushion practicing loving kindness, um, I find that really feeds into sense restraint. As I said the other day, you know, when an unwholesome thought, not even very unwholesome, but when it was arising, because of my loving kindness practice, it just didn't take root at all. It just didn't really establish itself because I could see my inner wisdom was protecting me. It could see that this was not for my benefit. So that thought never even took root. And in fact, a very pleasant thought immediately followed it. So it's a really big topic and I think you could do almost a whole retreat on that subject, but I hope that that's something for this evening. And uh, yeah, it's really lovely to share all this demo on all sorts of different themes. And I hope that I've covered most of them. I know there were maybe one or two questions that were missing from that, but please ask them next time and I'll come to you, okay? Or Ajahn Brown will come to you tomorrow. So it's uh, almost 10 past nine and it's time to end this session. So I wish you a very good, peaceful night. For some of you, it might be bedtime. For others, you may still have a meditation time. And uh, remember to look after your body. For me personally, if I'm going to meditate now, it's going to be on a very comfortable reclining chair so that I can really let go and relax and, and wind down before sleep. So please take care of yourself in the best way that you can. And, uh, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Uh, good night.